always waiting for something to turn up. It doesn't wait passive and inert for something to impress itself. It acts in accordance with its own structure on its surroundings. And so you get the built-in relationships because we're creatures of desire in a biological continuum, you see. Well, um, he uh, then has that outcome of the biological experience then follows suit and is much more a continuum um, than um, the atomistic view um, had made it seem. Um, And when it comes to talking about reason on page 95, halfway down the page, reason uh, was supposed separate from experience, introducing us to a superior region of universal truths. Uh, Reason um, as a Kantian faculty that introduces generality and regularity strikes us more and more superfluous. The unnecessary creation of men addicted to traditional formalism and elaborate terminology. So he's rejecting that conception and instead talks of concrete suggestions arising from the past employed as aims and methods of special reconstruction tested by success and failure That's the intelligent thinking that arises in the course of experience as we come up with ideas for for resolving problem situations. So the kind of reason that he wants is the problem-solving intelligence. Able to draw ideas from a fund of experience, select those that are appropriate to a problem situation, able to run through thought experiments, perhaps overt experiments, and then able to experientially confirm whether or not they'll actually work. Um, In other words, the kind of intelligence that's necessary for effecting change, for effecting change. So um, a whole conception different. Now, you you can see with that changed conception of experience why his conception of education was so different, you see. Because you're you're not now trying to teach people the art of dialectic or of abstraction, Plato, Aristotle, dialectic or abstraction which are needed for grasping eternal truths, you see, universal principles. No. Uh, Rather what you're doing is trying to develop in people the kind of practical intelligence which can um, find (coughs) something workable to do when some problem situation arises. Problem solving, you see. And so do his so-called progressive education was that sort of thing. So that ideally the classroom is the situation in which as problem situations arise, so people are free to explore the fund of ideas which may be in the books in the classroom (laughs) or in um, people's um, own experience and to come up with appropriate ways of uh, handling the thing, rather than the systematic kind of um, attempt to develop intellectual ability, which can abstract and work logically from uh, things which are abstracted. So, um, two different conceptions. Um, the, uh, The value of the heritage of learning It is in enriching the human fund of experience on which to draw in problem situations. In the spirit of the adage that he who neglects the past will repeat the mistakes of the past. But you see, the reason for examining the past is not to understand some eternal truths about human nature or history, 
uh, but rather to have resources for the future. Um, okay, then uh, chapter five, um, which I think was a chapter I omitted and said you needn't read. Am I right in that? Uh, yeah, I said chapters one through four. Well, you know, for good measure, read chapter five. Quality of mercy is not strained. I didn't want to impose too much. But, you know, after reading all, all the rest, you can run through this one so quickly. Um, what he's doing is um, simply rejecting Plato's dichotomy of the ideal and the real. Plato's dichotomy of the ideal and the real. Uh, we've noted that Dewey and Whitehead are alike, uh, very um, impatient with all of the traditional dualisms. Mind and body real, ideal and actual. You see. Uh, his point is that there is no platonic realm of transcendent ideals. You see. Unchanging, eternal ideals. No. Um, ideals simply arise as problems occur. The ideal is um, the resolution of the problem that you want, you see. And you therefore don't think of that ideal until uh, a resolution is needed. And then there is an ideal that is the value that you seek. Ideals are values that arise in the context of problem situations. So there is a fact-value continuum, is the way he puts it. Uh, this is where he breaks with the, not only with Plato's dualism, but with the Enlightenment dualism of fact and value. Living in a value-free universe, you see, values are sort of external intuitions. No, not so for Dewey. It may be, nature may be in and of itself a value-free universe. But our experience is not value-free. Our experience is primarily of desires. And if survival is threatened, then the ideal of survival comes into focus. It's valued. Yes, and so um, there is a continuum between fact and value, even though there are no eternal unchanging values. The continuum being in the process of experience. Well, that's the theme of um, what you're not reading. Um, the um, following chapter, number six, uh, two views of logic. <laughs> All right, the old logic was formal. It was deductive. The new logic is um, experiential. Uh, well, he calls it experimental. Yeah, it's scientific method. The, uh, the kind of Logic is structure, of course, order, uh, the kind of pattern of thought that is needed for problem solving. Uh, that's the sense of logic he's using, experimental thinking. It begins with observation of what the problem is, with... Um, recognition of what is at stake, the values that emerge, the values that are threatened, the values that are possible. And then there arise ideas. What are ideas? Oh, not um, simple ideas of secondary qualities, etc. No. Ideas are hypotheses. So that when you're in a mess and you say, well, I've got an idea of how to get out of this, that's the sort of idea Dewey wants. You see. An idea is simply a plan for action. 
what can we do about it? That, if you like, um, ordinary usage, sense of idea. And um, so the, um, the structure of thought, you see, is about ideas that are hypotheses rather than fixed conceptions, theoretical dogmas. Ideas that are simply instruments, their instrumental value. They have no intrinsic value, they're not intrinsically true. So, um, uh, James's uh, discussion of um, uh, truth as cash value applies perfectly here. It's the cash value um, in the situation where you are that's important. And uh, truth, accordingly, is not some fixed realm. It's um, rather having to do with satisfied desire. That is to say, an idea can be regarded as true if it is useful in satisfying the desires uh, that um, there are in a given situation. And um, on pages 155 to 157, the, uh, the crux of that, um, the bottom of 157, let me just read this part, truth as utility means service in making just that contribution to reorganization and experience, that is to say, adjusting to the environment, making just that contribution to reorganization that the idea claims to be able to make. The usefulness of a road is not measured by the degree in which it lends itself to the purposes of a highwayman, but by whether it actually functions as a road, as a means of easy and effective transportation. And so with the serviceableness of an idea. It's a hypothesis. And its truth is measured by whether it's a useful hypothesis. Simply. Um, now, uh, that, uh, that sort of uh, background is necessary, really, for getting at the moral reconstruction chapter. And um, here there are some uh, subtleties which um, I think we have to watch carefully. Uh, his use of the term utility in talking of ideas may tempt you to say that Dewey is a kind of utilitarian. But um, he would categorically repudiate the suggestion. Now, why? Well, you see, utilitarianism is a product of the old empiricism. An empiricism that um, built knowledge and decided what to do in the future but built it on the basis of past empirical generalizations. So that you develop moral rules for a utilitarian. You develop moral rules in terms of what past experience has taught you about maximizing the happiness or whatever good it is for the maximum number of people. Uh, the focus of knowledge is the past, 